Intergenerational tussles looming over the state pension. The cause? More leaks than a sinking ship from the Treasury and Downing Street that the triple lock on the value of the state pension is to be abandoned. Now, that lock pledges to boost the state pension by inflation, average earnings or 2.5%, whichever is the greater. Now, a combination of factors, not least the return to work after the coronavirus and a shortage of labour, have seen earnings surge. It may be a one-off, but there it is. Now, ministers want to pause as the public finances go from bad to worse. Pensioners, of course, cry foul. But younger people are saying, about time too. They're struggling with the cost of housing, the disruption to their education at school and university, and are saying, well, at least many of them are, it's about time we had our turn. Older folk have had it their way for quite long enough. Well, the, the, that the triple lock is a manifesto pledge seems almost irrelevant with international aid and the threat of a rise in national insurance to fund care. They've been falling like autumn fruit. So, who's going to win this particular tussle? Tom Spencer's a young voice who is fascinated, and I think I represented reasonably in my introduction. And Christopher Brooks is the head of public policy at Age Concern. Uh, Christopher, if I can start with you on the general point, don't we all have to tighten our belts in the current climate? And pensioners have had it pretty good for some time. Well, good evening, Alistair. Um, thanks for having me on this tonight. Um, I think it's um, still the case that there are a large number of pensioners living on very low incomes, um, which is very easy to forget. Um, and there's a, there's a stereotype out there that older people all have it good. And some, of course, do. But many are still living in poverty. There's still over two million older people actually living in poverty. And for them, the triple lock has been a really valuable lifeline as it, uh, over the, since it's been introduced about 10 years ago. It's raised the value of the state pension. Um, it, the, the UK has one of the lowest state pensions in the developed world. It's below the average as well, and it's less than half of what countries like France spend on their older people. And so what the triple lock has done is slowly raise the, the real value of the state pension. So it's caught up some of that ground that it had lost over the preceding decades. Sure. I completely so, accept that. But before coming to Tom, what the coronavirus has done is added £400 billion to public debt, long term and the short term deficit as well. Many of us are being asked to tighten our belts just for a wee while until the public finances are got back into order. Don't pensioners have an obligation to do their bit? That's all I'm asking. Well, I think that many people are doing their bit all the time. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of really good, really good things going on. And we've seen a lot of services that, that older people rely on locally cut to the bone. Like if you think about social care, for instance, it's really suffering hard times at the moment. Um, so obviously this year is really unique economic circumstances. And I think what we'd be really concerned about is if the government were to suspend the triple lock permanently and it, it became a long term thing where actually the state pension isn't going to gain up some of that ground that it's lost in the past. That would cause long term problems that would leave a lot of older people who live below the poverty line facing very difficult times. And it would greatly affect uh, future generations of older people as well. All right, let me, br let me bring Tom in at that point, talking about future generations, because, uh, uh, Tom, uh, from help for first-time buyers to student loans that many are never going to have to repay, to be brutally honest, you haven't had it that bad. Um, I'm not sure I would agree with that. So, for example, the, um, the help to first-time buyers thing you brought in, all that is going to do it. That's a demand-side uh, subsidy. So that really won't make it much easier for most young people to actually to actually purchase their first home and what we're looking at now is most young people have received a massive wage cut last year and as that has rebounded back we're now expecting average wage growth of about 8.8 uh, percent so while the the elder people have had a sort of flat line where they've continued to grow their pension at 2.5 uh, percent all young people are doing is getting back to where we should be and it doesn't make sense for older people to get an 8.8% pay rise simply because younger people are returning to where they should be had the um, COVID crisis not hit. But, but he says that, that it's catch up as far as the pensioners are concerned because internationally, by comparison, we are not doing terribly well. And as he rather unkindly but very accurately pointed out, it'll be your problem before too long. Um, 
although it, it will eventually uh, become my problem, we've been playing catch up since the policy was first brought in. If you look at the increase in wealth between 2006 and uh, 2016, half of that entire um, increase in wealth was born purely by people born between 1956 and 1965. Because of um, over 10 years now of uh, triple lock, we're no longer in a position where um, older people happen to be the poorest in society. The poverty rate for for people, uh, for older uh, boomers is actually lower than what it is for the general uh, uh, population. So while we do need to continue to support um, older people, and there are very much problems um, with things like um, uh, social care, it doesn't mean we need an 8.8 percent pay rise when the police are having frozen wages, nurses are only getting three percent, we're cutting for, uh, for foreign aid. We're being told constantly the budgets are tight. We simply can't justify 8.8 percent rise. That would mean four billion more in spending than what forecast literally in March. Christopher, let me bring you back. I mean, comment on that if you want to, but let me put another point to you that, that, that crossed my mind listening to, to Tom there as well. In the past, one of the greatest single defences that uh, older people had was that they were much more likely to vote than Tom's generation, and they were very likely to vote Conservative, because that tended to be the demographic profile. Um, does it genuinely surprise you that it looks as if the Conservative government majority of 80 are saying, bye-bye? Um, I think that... I think older people are more likely to vote. Um, I don't know exactly how they vote, but... Um, I think it's obvious that politicians are going to look for the votes and look at how their electorate are, are likely to, what's going to swing them in their favour. And I think, the, I think the really crucial thing here is that this isn't really about pitching one generation against another. There are undoubtedly, as Tom said, there are lots of younger people who have also had a really tough year and also need the support that, that will help them through difficult times. And, and that, that could be the government uh, putting in place different measures to support them and help people in, back into work, help people progress with training and skills and earn enough money to build up a decent pension pot so that then when, when they come to retire, they can afford to step back from work and, and have a decent standard of living. And the flip side, Tom, of that argument is that there is increasing evidence that younger folk and I mean, the numbers that Jeremy Corbyn attracted to the Labour Party, a, a, a stark demographic example of that, um, seem to be turning away from traditional politics and a mixed economy uh, that is supposed to work for all. Is this yet another example of them saying, there we are, you see, they let down the elderly people, they don't do enough for us and what have you, so that your generation will not only turn away from a particular political party, but will turn away from a political system? Um, I'm not quite sure this is as charged an issue as that among young people, although I, I personally see it very much as an issue. I think young people are more concerned with their um, education outcomes, job outcomes. And if and I, I don't really see how keeping the, the triple lock or, or uh, scrapping it for a few years would have that much effect on youth turnout. But I do think there has very much been a long time where the youth have been somewhat ignored. Um, housing costs are higher than they've been ever. And it's the problem's only actually getting worse. So I do think there does need to be a focus on youth issues if the party want to recruit a youth vote. But I'm not sure the triple lock really will affect it in any way. And finally, to both of you, Christopher, first, uh, I gave the introduction that I did and, and, and the history and the background to it. Um, we've talked about the budget uh, in general terms, not least in the cashless society and what have you. But, Christopher, angry and disappointed though you are, is it your sense that that will be the case come uh, Rishi Sunak standing up there at the dispatch box and delivering the budget? That you'll lose. Yeah, politics is full of difficult decisions to take, and it's certainly, given the unique circumstances of the time, it's certainly possible that they will suspend the triple lock. Mm. Um, I mean, I can understand why they would do that, because suddenly 25 to 8.8% .8 is a significant difference. But at the same time, we just it's really important that we remember that there are still a lot of older people who are living in poverty, really struggling to make ends meet, um, and that the, pen the state pension makes up the bulk of most people's income. And so it is vitally important so in the longer term, we need to make sure that value increases and that sure. we're bringing all, all older people up to a decent standard of living. Sure. And Tom, finally to you, again, I've watched more budgets than I've had hot dinners. Given your analysis of the need to keep young folk on board and not drive them away, if I'm wrong about that with the Corbyn Easters, but to keep them on side, would you expect that there will be some sweetener for young folk as well, so that, uh, you know, that, 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 as it were, you're kept on side despite those problems of, of, of housing uh, and, and, and on education particularly? Are you looking for some goodies? 
Um, I think there may be some window dress throw away to, to young people. There always is um, the odd thing, but normally it's things which sound very good and do sell newspapers. But when you actually get into the weeds of, of the policy, they very rarely have a big impact on young people. I think if we're looking at purely young people, it's the, um, it's the Housing Act, which should be coming soon, which will have the biggest impact on um, their well-being. Yeah, that, and, I, and, and I suspect also that Christopher would agree that the uh, final statement on, on, on care may be more important for those of a certain age as well. Uh, Tom and Christopher, thank you both very much indeed. And